And first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today. I really do appreciate you taking the time to participate. And before we get too far into our session today, I thought it would be best to establish a foundation to kind of start at the beginning, especially given the gravity of a subject like lessons learned from retirement plan litigation. When I say starting at the beginning, I'm not talking about ERISA 1974. I'd like to focus on the summer of 1987 when a new band emerged on the American rock scene. We're, of course, talking about Guns N' Roses. In the summer of 1987, Guns N' Roses released Appetite for Destruction, which was their first studio album. It was one of the best-selling albums of its era, amassing over 30 million copies sold. The album features some of the band's most recognizable songs, Welcome to the Jungle, Paradise City, Sweet Child of Mine, admittedly a different opening than you were probably expecting, but look at the names, Appetite for Destruction, Welcome to the Jungle, sounds pretty litigious to me. Paradise City, maybe for the attorneys. More importantly for our purposes today though, let me focus on Sweet Child of Mine. Sweet Child of Mine was written by the band's lead singer, Axl Rose. He's the very approachable fellow down front there. If you read through the lyrics, the song is basically a valentine to his girlfriend. Four verses consisting of 104 words with references to her smile, face, eyes, hair, the lyrics take up less than one minute of a five-minute song. Following the lyrical portion of the song, Slash, the legendary guitar player, takes over with an incredible three-minute long guitar solo. Slash is the expressive fellow with the hat on the left. At the end of the guitar solo, the song descends into what's called a breakdown, a collection of rapidly repeating mini solos cycling through the group for about a minute. In the breakdown, the band keeps repeating the same line. Where do we go now? Where do we go now? Where do we go now? So are they planning a vacation, perhaps a tour? Is Axel going to propose or just what exactly? The answer is none of the above. The credit of the where do we go breakdown goes to Spencer Proffer, a music producer the band was considering to produce their album. The story is the band didn't really care for the idea of the song. They delayed recording the song until the very end of their studio time. When Axel laid down the lyrics, Spencer Proffer said, a one-minute song just isn't marketable. So Axel asked Slash to do a guitar solo, simply to add time. Although it turned out to be what many consider to be Slash's best work, Slash took the last-minute request as an insult. Spencer Proffer did not think the straightforward lyrics followed by a guitar solo was enough, so he asked the group to think harder. Axel Rose started thinking out loud. Where do we go? Where do we go now? The band started mocking Axel, repeating the same lines, and Spencer Proffer, in a frustrated state, simply said, just sing that. For as popular as the band would be from 1987 to 1994, Sweet Child of Mine is surprisingly Guns N' Roses' only number one hit on the Billboard singles charts. It was also the song they were asked to perform when they were admitted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2012, an event that Axel Rose did not attend. Today, the points made in this session, lessons learned from retirement plan litigation, will be straightforward lyrics brought to life with meaningful illustrations, our version of a guitar solo, though probably less entertaining. The most important part of the presentation will be to offer steps you can take to improve your retirement plan, our version of where do we go now, but with purpose and clarity. So let's talk about the fundamentals. Without a doubt, far and away, the number one area for litigation with retirement plans is excessive fees. That's probably not a surprise to most of those listening. Since the release of 408B2 a few years ago, it seems like all we hear about with retirement plans is fees. Most conferences talk about fees, and you've likely sat in on sessions that discuss fees and benchmarking. As most plan sponsors know, ERISA states that plan fees must be, quote, reasonable. But what does that mean exactly? How do you know if your plan fees are reasonable? And how would a litigator know if your fees are reasonable? You know, where do these types of litigation get started? The first step in any litigation is for an unhappy employee or former employee to give an attorney the fee disclosure information that you are required to provide to them each year, that 408B2 notice. The second step is to compare the cost of the overall plan to the current market environment. This is accomplished by taking the individual information from a single employee, 
extrapolating that number to the size of the plan, as detailed in your most 5500 filings, and conducting a very simple fee benchmark analysis. Keep in mind that this is an attorney conducting this analysis, but it's the very same type of analysis that you, as a plan sponsor, are charged with conducting on your own. The value of the lawsuit is determined by taking the single year estimate of excessive fees and multiplying that number by six in accordance with the statute of limitations under ERISA. The third step is to assess the difficulty of success by looking at the core investment options and services offered to the participants of your retirement plan. The best way to think about this would be to identify any sign of neglect, like underperforming investments, high expense ratio investments, investments that are difficult to monitor, like capital preservation and target date options, and services that would be difficult for most committee members to explain. We'll talk about specific examples as we go through the material today, but the points that I will be discussing are straight out of the headlines and are a matter of public record. I just want to emphasize that none of these companies we're going to talk about, like companies you represent, have the absolute best interest of their employees at heart. They all have the best interest of their employees at heart. Any reference to these companies or their vendors is not intended to cast doubt on their commitment to their employees. And while most of these companies are quite large, the lessons learned apply to organizations of all sizes. So let's start with Delta. Uh, the Delta Airlines 401k plan has 91,000 participants and $8.1 billion in assets. We're going to use Delta as an example as we move through the early part of this webinar. As I mentioned previously, this is a very large plan, but the lessons will be applicable to plans of all sizes. Like the title of the session, we want to look at these types of cases and see what lessons we can learn from those who have already experienced litigation. So for Delta, the company is accused of failing to select low-cost investments and failing to use the plan's size to negotiate cheaper record-keeping fees. A proposed class action lawsuit has been filed against the company, members of the retirement plan committee, and, quote, other fiduciaries, alleging violations of ERISA regarding excessive fees. If you see the term other fiduciaries and wonder what exactly that means, you're definitely not alone. Many plan sponsors are unaware of exactly whom can be roped into litigation as it applies to the retirement plan. Other plan fiduciaries would include the board of directors and officers of the company that may believe they have little, if anything, to do with the retirement plan. The reason these individuals can be named in connection with the retirement plan is that they're in a position of responsibility and authority to ensure that the retirement plan is managed prudently and for the exclusive benefit of the employees. In order to be a plan fiduciary and therefore named in litigation, you simply have to be in a position where you have the ability to exercise control over the plan. It doesn't mean you actually have to exercise that control. In fact, quite the opposite, many folks that do have that fiduciary title have the ability to exercise the control and are never involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the plan. But it's just that you have the ability to do so. So those with a C before their title, all the CEOs, CFOs, COOs, et cetera, are all likely to be named anytime there's a lawsuit for the retirement plan. The Delta complaint noted that there were easy remedies for all the issues cited and that the defendants failed to take action. The objective of plaintiff's counsel will be to prove that the plan sponsor failed to document the deliberations and discussions triggered by their fiduciary oversight. Unfortunately, this has been very easy to prove in most of the legal actions to date. Examples given in the complaint with respect to failure to select low-cost investments included very straightforward share class decisions. So let me take you through one example of how share classes can impact the overall expense of the plan and the revenue sharing returned as a result. So first, in order to provide this baseline understanding, I'd like to review three terms that we use quite a bit in our industry, which are share class, basis points, and revenue sharing. You might be familiar with these, but just to give a bit of a baseline understanding. This slide shows the overall structure of a mutual fund. The name of the portfolio is illustrated in the middle, ABC large cap growth, and can be thought of as the core of the fund itself. The four corners surrounding it represent the share classes available for this same core fund the A, R1, R3, and R6 share classes. The industry term used to describe pricing is basis points. So there are 100 basis points in 1%. So the R6 share classes, in blue at the bottom right of the slide, is priced at one-third of 1% 1 or 33 basis points. 
In this illustration, the R6 share class might be the lowest cost institutional version offering no remuneration to offset plan fees. So the remuneration is commonly referred to as revenue sharing. Most folks have heard that term revenue sharing before. So the R6 shares are offering no revenue sharing to offset plan fees. Based on this illustration, a good estimate would be that the A share class, which is in yellow at the top left, offers 33 basis points in revenue sharing. This is because it has a price of 66 basis points, exactly 33 basis points higher than the cost of the R6 share class in blue. The R1 share class in red at the top right would likely pay 110 basis points to offset fees as the expense ratio is 110 basis points higher than the R6 share class below it in blue. To make things even more confusing, keep in mind that many fund families have completely different naming conventions for their share classes and completely different numbers associated with revenue sharing. So while this example uses things like A, R1, R3, R6, another fund family might use no letters for one of their share class, administrative for another, and institutional for yet another. But what's important isn't those individual designations but rather the expenses and revenue sharing associated with those designations. So while there's not necessarily a right answer to which share class your plan should use, it is absolutely critical that you understand these principles and how your organization is selecting and monitoring the classes you do in fact utilize. So now that we have a baseline understanding of share classes, let's get back to Delta and a real world example documented in their litigation. So these investments on the slide here now were the core investment options that were specifically named in the Delta Airlines lawsuit. So why these three? The first reason is because of the mismatch in share classes for the same fund company. As you can see above, the plan used Janus S shares for the Janus 40 fund and Janus T shares for the Janus Research Fund. As with our example on the previous slide, the revenue paid by these two investments is different from one another, and the expenses is very different from one another. The second reason these three were cited is because a lower cost share class was available for all three of the above investments, but no action was taken. This is fairly inconsistent work, and it's pretty easy to see once it's pointed out. In the not too distant past, it was considered a best practice to use the revenue sharing to offset plan fees for the benefit of the participants. While it is still true that ERISA allows for revenue sharing to be used to offset plan expenses, the lesson learned from recent litigation is that because of these types of differences in share classes between fund families, it is entirely possible that one participant may be contributing more to offset plan fees than other participants in the plan. So again, one participant may be carrying an undue burden and paying a higher percentage of plan fees than another participant. So again, let's look at a specific example. What we're showing here is an ex actual example we found in the plan of one of our new clients last year. This plan has over $145 million in total assets, and we've split those assets into two buckets. The first is almost $25 million invested in the plan's stable value fund, and the second is the remaining nearly $121 million invested in the plan's other 24 investment options. The $25 million invested in the stable value fund represents only about 17% of total plan assets. However, the revenue sharing generated from this single investment is offsetting almost 58% of plan fees. Again, 17% of plan assets offsetting 58% of plan fees. That would be like on your next flight, having the first five rows of passengers pay for the airfare of the first 18 rows of a 30-row flight. Sound equitable and fair? Of course it's not. In order to tackle these types of challenges, plan sponsors need to ensure they're performing an analysis of the share class selection and utilization of plan revenue sharing for the offset of plan fees. Many record-keeping vendors have technology that can eliminate these types of imbalances by returning revenue sharing generated by investments directly back to the investments that produced the revenue in the first place. So again, back to Delta for a moment. The complaint with respect to excessive record keeping fees included a few very straightforward examples. The lawsuit alleges the defendants failed to undertake a competitive bidding process for record keeping services. And while the defendants paid a flat per participant fee as direct compensation for record keeping services, 
They also paid indirect compensation based on the amount of invested assets from the revenue sharing and other subsidies retained by the record keeper. So while the company agreed to allow the record keeper to receive the revenue sharing, they failed to limit or monitor the record keeper's total compensation. Again, the statute of limitations for damages involving ERISA is six years. So the lawsuit alleges the defendant's conduct cost participants and the proposed plaintiff's class millions of dollars needlessly expended in excessive fees over a period of six years. So note, and this is very important, unfortunately the talking points used in this example are more common in retirement plans, especially going back six years given the statute of limitations, than most professionals in the industry would like to admit. For that reason alone, we will definitely continue to see escalated attention on matters related to plan fees and investment costs. So how do you approach these topics with your own committees and executive teams? I believe it would be less than effective to focus on the possibility of litigation with most corporate executive suites. While the problems are real and they're fairly easy to prove, executives are generally not very motivated by the potential of litigation. There are too many issues out there where those um, with solutions are very quick to, quote, back up the ambulance, and many executives may even view recommendations as an unnecessary distraction given their list of other priorities. My recommendation is to always make observations uh, regarding corporate benefits personal to the audience. So the real damage regarding excessive fees goes beyond the cost of litigation. It's the dilution due to the compounding of the individual's retirement savings. So let me give you an example of what that means. So these are points of friction. So even a moderate deterioration in return because of excessive fees, not replacing investment options and or poor plan design can have a huge impact on how long a person's money will last to meet their retirement needs. So the baseline assumptions to achieve retirement security has been defined in numerous studies as accumulating enough assets to replace 80% of your retirement income on, of your pre-retirement income on an annual basis starting at age 67 and lasting for at least the next 25 years until age 92. You'll need retirement savings equal to at least eight times your final year of income. The amount of annual savings needed to accumulate this sum will be driven by an expected long-term rate of return. So let's assume for a moment that while accumulating your retirement savings, the employee earned just 0.25% less than the expected return for whatever reason. The result is they reach retirement with 7.58 times their final annual income instead of eight times. And the impact is in blue there. If green is the ultimate perfect world scenario, you have enough money to last till age 92, eight times your retirement income. In blue, you can see the impact. The impact is that their savings will last three years short of their objective and only to age 89. The alternative is to reduce their retirement income to 77% of their pre-retirement income in order to have their retirement savings last until age 92. So expressed as percentages, with just a one quarter of a percent reduction in return, you get a 12% reduction in how long the savings will last or an almost 4% reduction in retirement income. Going up through the next few scenarios, a half a percent shortfall translates to retirement savings that are only equal to 7.18 times the employee's final annual income. The impact to retirement security is that the savings will last five years short of their objective, so now to only age 87 instead of age 92. In order to stretch the retirement income to age 92, the replacement income would need to be reduced to 74% of pre-retirement income. That's a 20% reduction in how long their savings will last, or a 7.5% reduction in retirement income to improve their chances of getting out there to age 92. Going to a three quarters of a percent shortfall means 6.82 times final annual income. The savings will be spent by age 85 or seven years short, and the remedy is to have their savings, to have their savings last till age 92, would be to drop the annual spend to 71% of pre-retirement income, which is a 28% reduction in how long the savings will last, or a reduction of over 11% in retirement income. And then finally, at the top in red, with just a 1% shortfall in their earnings, that reduces their annual income to 6.47 times when they hit retirement age. The savings will be spent by age 83, which is a nine-year shortfall of getting to age 92. The remedy is to have the savings last until age 92, would be to drop annual spend to 71% of pre-retirement income, 
which is a 36% reduction in how long the savings will last or a 15% reduction in retirement income. So again, I know that's going through a lot of statistics. It's a lot of different scenarios, but the takeaway really is going from the perfect world scenario all the way through those examples to uh, this one at the top there in red, it's only a 1% difference from the top to the bottom and how long your retirement income is going to last. It's a nine-year difference. In the, the top scenario in red, you only last until age 83 until you exhaust your retirement savings. That 1% reduction in return can be from share class selection, excessive fees, underperforming investments. It can be the participant's fault even for picking the wrong asset allocation. But there's a lot of different points of friction that can lead to very dramatic results in how prepared someone is for retirement. So can you hear me now? Yes, a suit was filed against Verizon for many of these same complaints in February of 2016. Maybe that's why Paul switched to Sprint. So bringing this back to a final example with Delta Airlines, plaintiffs contend that a typical 401k plan offers roughly 14 investment options, and note that the defendants offered at least 200 investment options in the plan prior to 2011. This mindset was very common 15 years ago as record-keeping platforms gained the technology to open their ability to utilize a broader range of investment alternatives on their platforms. The thinking of plan sponsors was, well, more options for the participant is a better thing. We'll give them lots of options and let them pick what works best for them. However, as many of you listening probably know, participants are historically very bad at making decisions for themselves and having an expansive menu of investment options can have an effect that is the opposite of that which was intended. Plaintiffs in the Delta case allege that many of the 200 options offered were functionally equivalent or otherwise duplicative and added nothing but additional confusion. Plaintiffs say Delta failed to monitor the investments they offered and instead allowed numerous poorly performing investment options to remain in the plan. So moving to this next slide, rather than pick on Delta alone, I'd like to take you through a number of examples for a variety of other companies. All of the companies you see on this slide here are organizations that you'll likely recognize and are all organizations that have been named in litigation concerning their retirement plans. As we proceed through these examples, I'm going to separate them into various broad categories regarding the challenges they've been faced with defending. Again, as I mentioned previously, these are all good companies with their employees' best interests at heart. With that said, we can learn from the challenges that they face. So our first group is Starwood Hotels and Anthem under the heading of our favorite topic, excessive fees. So for Starwood Hotels, this case questions the hotel chain's 401k plan fees and investment choices. Many of you may have heard or be familiar with the United States Supreme Court case of Tibble versus Edison International, whereby it was ruled that planned fiduciaries have an ongoing duty to monitor investments. In this case, one of the arguments was that because an investment had been in the plan for longer than six years, you're outside of the statute of limitations and there's no need to monitor it. While well, this case ruled then it continues to be in the plan, so as long as it is in the plan, that six-year clock continues to restart. The case was really a game changer in that just about every lawsuit since has tried to establish that the plan sponsor has failed to monitor and document the basis of their investment decisions. So the complaint against Starwood Hotels cites this Tibble versus Edison International case alleging that Starwood had the bargaining power to obtain and maintain lower fees, but that Starwood did not exercise this power for many years. Ironically, at the same time as the Tibble decision, Starwood managed to cut the fees of its fund offerings in half. In fact, fees were reduced by 40 basis points. This means that over a six-year period, the statute of limitations, the plan incurred an unnecessary $20 million in investment fees that were incurred by plan participants. Now, that $20 million is calculated as 40 basis points times $1 billion in assets equals $4 million per year for five years. The reason the calculation is only for five years and not six is that the plan had the lower cost arrangement in place during the preceding year before the suit was filed. The lawsuit then cites an independent assessment of record keeping fees, which found the median record keeping fee in the market to be significantly lower. The allegation being that the Starwood 
folks could have negotiated better rates. The plaintiffs also note the plan's failure to offer a stable value solution versus money market during a virtually zero interest rate environment for money market funds. In the time since the financial crisis of 2008, many of you are probably aware that money market funds have had nearly zero returns, many even waiving a portion of their management fees to prevent from posting negative returns. During this same time period, stable value funds have had returns in excess of 2%. The lawsuit calculates the damages for this misstep alone for Starwood at $18 million. That's 2.29% in lost interest on $133 million in assets over the course of six years. Moving on to Bell versus Anthem, this is an interesting, if not somewhat unbelievable example. Um, the Anthem plan had an index fund with a four basis point expense ratio. However, they qualified for the two basis point expense ratio version of the same fund, but failed to implement this change. So while it seems unbelievable that a lawsuit was born from a difference of two basis points, two one-hundredths of one percent, for simple math on the $100 million that Anthem participants had invested in this fund, that's an extra $20,000 in fees per year charged to participants that could have been avoided by simply changing the share class utilized by the plan. So moving on from excessive fees, our next topic concerns self-dealing. Um, self-dealing, you may be familiar with the term, is the practice of an, ongoing, of an organization using their own products on an ongoing basis in their retirement plans. So the first case is for Cryer versus Franklin Resources, and Franklin Resources would be at the bottom right there. They're the group which offers Franklin templates and mutual funds. The investment menu for Franklin Resources' own retirement plan consisted of 40 proprietary Franklin Templeton funds supplemented by a single S&P 500 index fund managed by State Street Global Advisors. Sorry, but to touch on fees again, all funds had considerably higher expense ratios than one would pay, uh, would typically find uh, in a corporate retirement plan. Beyond these fees, however, the lawsuit also documented chronic underperformance in the investment options over sustained periods of time. Finally, it was also noted that the plan had the Franklin Money Market Fund rather than a stable value option, um, just as we discussed with the Starwood case. For Charles Schwab, the plaintiffs allege that the company reaped significant fees and profits at the expense of the plan and its participants. The investment menu for their own retirement plan consisted of seven Schwab mutual funds, 10 Schwab target date funds, the Schwab stable value, Schwab Advantage Money Market, Schwab Savings Account, Schwab self-directed brokerage. I'm sure you hear a trend there. That's right, 21 investment options, and every single one of them were their own proprietary products. The song is the same, higher expense ratios with documented underperformance and no action taken. I think it would be fairly hard to prove that every one of Schwab's investment options were the most appropriate options for each of the categories they represent within the plan. So next, as we move on to the issue of failure to monitor capital preservation options, we'll stick with Charles Schwab for a moment. What's a little bit different in this lawsuit is the observation that the Schwab retirement plan fiduciaries made no meaningful investigation of the capital preservation options, either at the time those investments were added or on an ongoing basis as part of a periodic review of the plan's portfolio. So we need to emphasize this point because we have found that it's incredibly common for plan sponsors to have absolutely no documentation as to why they utilize the stable value option they do or how they monitor it on an ongoing basis. And this is often difficult due to the fact that stable value funds are not widely reported in the open market the way that most plan investments are, such as through Morningstar, Google Finance, uh, et cetera, wherever you find your, your typical uh, information on investments. So to monitor these kinds of investment options requires a direct contact with the stable value fund provider and an ongoing tracking of the various attributes of the fund. Again, documentation that it remains appropriate. For Abbott versus Lockheed Martin, this is another case dealing with the stable value fund. While this case was settled for $62 million, about two-thirds of the value of the settlement was derived from the allegation that the stable value was too conservative and had returns more like a money market fund. So for Lockheed Martin, although they were using a stable value fund, unlike the Starwood Hotels example two slides ago, the ultra conservative nature of the fund resulted in returns more in line with money market funds. And so 
we had that same kind of argument. Why were we in an investment option that was not competitive when there were other options available that had the same level of risk but an increased level of return? So this slide is going to give some examples of how target date funds, which are quite common in most retirement plans, can have a detrimental effect. Most plan sponsors use target date funds for their QDIA or Qualified Default Investment Alternative, and they're seen as a very positive investment option for their retirement plan participants. Unfortunately, this is going to go uh, along and bring us back to the recurring theme of excessive fees, but more in the context of probing the fiduciary process. So our first example is Johnson versus Fujitsu. According to the complaint, as of the end of 2013, the Fujitsu plan had approximately $1.3 billion in assets. The lawsuit contends that among defined contribution plans with more than a billion dollars in assets, this plan is playing three times higher than the average fee for comparable plans. So according to the complaint, in October 2011, the defendants transferred a large majority of the plan's assets into a set of custom target date funds designed by an investment advisory firm also named as a defendant in the case. The suit goes on to describe the target date funds as fundamentally flawed given the investment advisory firm does not have a public track record of managing or designing target date funds. So in other words, where is the documentation of a fiduciary process that led them to the ultimate decision that changing to these alternative target date fund approach was prudent? If the investment advisory firm has no public track record of managing or designing target date funds and no performance to compare against, how was the decision reached? For Intel, it was a, as simple as stating that there are too many non-traditional assets in its target date series. Do they have the documentation to illustrate why they've taken this approach? Again, it's not a matter of being right or wrong and whether or not having non-traditional assets in your uh, target date funds is, uh, is appropriate but rather of documenting how you reached that decision and why you ultimately went with the options that have the non-traditional assets versus just traditional target date investments. In another case of Lorenz versus Safeway, the suit concerned excessive fees, but the approach changed. So in 2011, a target date series using an index approach with an expense ratio of 13 basis points was replaced by the record keeper's target date solution using an index approach that had an expense ratio of 50 basis points. So unfortunately, the new funds have underperformed as compared to the funds that were replaced, which isn't necessarily the point of contention. The challenge is why Safeway moved from an indexed approach at 13 basis points of expense to another indexed approach at an expense of 50 basis points, ultimately for lower performance. And in looking at the specifics, the case will focus on whether that differential in uh, expense of 37 basis points is what caused the underperformance. So our next example is concern company stock. Um, this won't apply to everyone, uh, but roughly 18% of 401k plans offer company stock as an investment option, according to the plan sponsor, Council of America. In the case of Ramirez versus JCPenney, everyone's familiar with JCPenney stores, uh, the plaintiff claimed that the plan fiduciaries knew the company stock, which was offered as an investment option, was an imprudent investment because it was artificially inflated in value and therefore breached the company's fiduciary duties. The plan held roughly $514 million in the JCPenney Common Stock Fund around December 2011 and around December 2011, which is roughly 15% of total plan assets at that time, according to the original complaint. In November 2011, the stock price was $31 per share, but it declined to just $9 per share as of September 2013. So as it turns out, JCPenney is poised to pay $4.5 million just to settle allegations over company stock in the firm's 401k plan following a district court judge's preliminary approval of a settlement. In another very similar case, in Whitley versus BP, the court held that there was no viable defensive action the fiduciaries could have taken to protect the value of the company stock holdings in the plan that would not have simply inflamed the collapse of the stock price. Along the same thread, in Fifth Third versus Dudenhofer, the US Supreme Court's decision created the need for plan participants to prove for their stock top drop claims to proceed that plan fiduciaries could have taken action during or before 
the collapse in value of the company's stock that would have made the situation better and not worse. So in other words, in all of these cases, these cases are key in deciding how company stock will be handled moving forward. If you as a company know that something is coming that will impact the company stock in a negative fashion, what can you do to help the value in your retirement plan that won't simply expose or exacerbate the problem of the stock price falling? There's no easy answers, but they're questions plan sponsors should be aware of and asking if they have company stock exposure in their plans. So for our final two examples, we'll talk about unusual holdings. Participants in the FMC Corporation Savings and Investment Plan have sued the plan sponsor over the plan's offering of a specific investment named the Sequoia Fund. According to the complaint, the Sequoia Fund is a high-cost, non-diversified mutual fund. The complaint says the fiduciary should have known that throughout 2015, in violation of the plan's investment policy regarding concentration and in spite of the concerns of the fund shareholders, the Sequoia Fund's assets were concentrated in a single stock, in Valiant Pharmaceuticals. The Sequoia Fund was the largest shareholder of Valiant Pharmaceuticals in 2015, representing a 10% ownership in the fund. This single position made up more than 30% of the Sequoia Fund's total assets. This case moved forward because of the clear violations illustrated in the FMC's investment policy and communicated by participants invested in the fund to FMC. Now, Disney was sued over the same holding, the Sequoia Fund, but a federal court in California dismissed the charges, finding that participants had not plausibly alleged that the plan's fiduciaries were responsible for monitoring the underlying investments in the mutual fund and not just the mutual fund itself. Same fund, same concerns, but very different outcomes. One could argue why there were different outcomes ranging from good lawyers to company size, etc., but it's more appropriate to simply state that the differentiating factor between these two was the type of documentation in place and the action or inaction that took place. So where do we go now? It comes down to the second part of our webinar title. Are you asking the right questions? Not just what are the lessons learned from retirement plan litigation, but are you in fact asking the right questions? What you'll see here are four points that I want to hit as we come through the end of the webinar this afternoon. It's structure, discipline, and documentation, annual due diligence, what are the evolving targets that we're seeing, and then what is an engaged committee, and how can you ensure that you have, in fact, an engaged committee. So the action steps are to have structure, discipline, and documentation, and a few areas of focus include peer group benchmarking of record keeping fees, investment expenses and performance, and any other recurring expenses paid out of participant accounts. We'll talk about how these fees are paid in a moment, but benchmarking goes a long way to not only provide a trail of due diligence, but also to negotiating fees that are competitive for your plan and its participants. Beyond actually performing this monitoring effort and this benchmarking, you need to keep formal documentation of all investment and service-related deliberations and decisions. Again, it's not necessarily about the outcome, but much more about what's the process, what's the decision-making process that got you to where you ended up. If challenged in court, the plan will then have evidence in place that it can prove it went through a prudent process in making any and all given decisions. So for annual due diligence, what, what do you want to ask for? Um, there's a whole list of things here. Um, audited financials give you a little bit of direction in terms of what's the financial stability of your providers, whether it's your record keeper or your advisor or your TPA. It gives you just a little bit of direction for the strength and if they're promising things like being a fiduciary, whether they have the resources to back those promises. Regulatory filings, uh, you want to make sure that if you're getting an audit that you're getting um, all the various reports and auditor's reports that you need, uh, that you're getting 408B2 filings, that um, really just getting all of the different pieces, um, ADV uh, Form 2As from your advisors, um, all of the different filings that are required each year. Uh, professional liability coverage for ERISA, um, this would apply primarily to investment advisors. You want to make sure that they have the insurance that they need for the professional judgment that they provide to your plan in order to ensure that they're really able to protect you on an ongoing basis. Privacy notices and non-solicitation agreements, 
Um, really, that agreement that they're not going to share information that you might provide to them, and that they're not going to go out and try and solicit your employees for other services. If their job is to be your investment advisor, you want to ensure that they're not also selling insurance or annuities or IRAs. And there's, there's new laws coming into play that will help uh, put a little bit better guardrails on what is able to happen there. But very clearly, getting a non-solicitation agreement can help uh, cross some of those bridges for you. Contract requirements, there are some things that you can go through in your contracts, words to exclude. Um, you want to exclude things like gross negligence or intent to cause harm, things that are very hard to prove without also kind of pointing the finger back at yourself. Uh, for example, if you say, um, we have to prove gross negligence, we go out and say this person did all these various things and they were terrible and they're grossly negligent. Well, it's pretty hard to prove all those different things without also someone coming back and saying, well, if they were so terrible and all of these things were going on, then how didn't you know? So do you have a failure to monitor? And did you not do your own fiduciary duty by making sure that you were watching for these types of things to be going on? And you want to ensure that you're getting things like a hold harmless and an agreement to defend. And um, going through your agreements and just picking out a few of these things can really help to ensure that you defray some of your risk where you can out to your providers rather than just having it all on your own shoulders. In evolving targets, you know, we've talked about a lot of this as we've gone through the presentation today. Um, in all the lessons we've covered, it's clear that there's just a few common evolving targets. Um, the first one would be capital preservation, money market funds versus stable value funds. Again, with the very, very low interest rate environment that we've had over the last handful of years, where money markets had a zero return or very low, uh, stable value funds had a much higher return, let's say over 2%. Well, now we're seeing a rising interest rate environment. Uh, money market rates are coming up, and now they're kind of getting close, or at least approaching stable value returns for some uh, portfolios. And so when we see that switch, and then money market returns are higher than stable values. It's not about switching from one to the other and always having the one that has the highest return, but rather documenting that you understand the long-term implications and why you have the investments that you do. Seldom documented investments, the things we talked about, like stable value funds, target date funds, managed accounts, understanding why you use the ones that you do and that you're monitoring them on an ongoing basis and have that documentation in place. If it's a managed account solution, why are you using the one that you're using? Is it in fact meeting its stated obligations and its stated uh, objectives? Just making sure you're documenting all the different pieces for why you have it. Concentrated holdings goes to that Sequoia fund example how many holdings are underlying your mutual funds? Are they taking sector bets or odd allocations? You just want to make sure that you're actually digging deeper than simply saying all of our funds have good performance. Good performance is inherently good, uh, but you want to ensure that uh, you're not setting yourself up for a fall later and that there's not undue risk being put out there for your employees to have potential risks going down the road. Fee methodology. Uh, I talked a little bit about participants, and you want to look at how the fees are being paid, um, whether it's through revenue sharing, whether it's through direct charges to their accounts. Um, you want to look at how the charges are calculated by your record keepers and your advisors. Is there a flat fee? Is it a per participant fee? Is it an asset-based fee? And then deciding how you want to apply those charges out to your employees. And um, again, just reviewing to make sure that it's going to be equitable. Um, if it's an asset-based fee, you can still do it per capita to your employees, but it's going to depend on the average account balance in your uh, organization, and you want to look and make sure that there aren't certain participants that are carrying an undue portion of the overall plan's expenses. So just looking at that fee methodology and making sure that you understand how are our charges assessed to plan participants. And then an engaged committee. So an engaged committee sounds um, fairly uh, intuitive. Um, it's one of the most uh, critical steps for any retirement plan, and it's quite simply saying we have a committee that meets on a regular basis, that has minutes, that has consistent attendance, that documents it is, in fact, engaged in the process of monitoring the retirement plan. Um, examples of inconsistent attendance would be that the CEO very much wants to be on the retirement plan committee but hasn't been to a committee meeting in two years. You're documenting that someone is actively disengaged, that they might be on the committee, but they're not taking it seriously. Those are the types of people you want to get off the committee. Keep them involved, you know, give them updates, you know, let them know what decisions are being made, 
but getting them off the committee so you're not continuously documenting things that you wouldn't want in the, the minutes and you wouldn't want uh, someone to come back and ask you about at a later time. So again, the most critical step is having an engaged committee, having those providers that are going to help engage you as a committee to ensure that uh, you'll be able to, to make the right decisions, have the right documentation, and hopefully avoid litigation as you go down the road. With that, I do thank everybody for participating in today's webinar, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at one of the